Seriously, I am so glad you are here. You have no idea. You have made my day, you've made my month, you've made my year, you've made my life that you are here. And um, I'm going to introduce your speaker here, the Reverend Dr. Peter Scare. And um, he has been so gracious. He's been flying all over the place, back and forth from Fort Wayne. He had to speak at Symposia last week, and then he hopped on a plane, came down here, and he changed his whole schedule just so that he could help me out in time of grief because I needed um, somebody to speak to you that has inspiration, passion, and knows what they're talking about. So um, the Reverend Dr. Peter Skier is the Assistant Professor of Exegetical Theology at Concordia Theological Seminary, Fort Wayne, Indiana, and I know a lot of you already know him. Um, he earned a PhD and MA at the University of Notre Dame. Really sorry about that BCS Bowl. We were there sitting in the Notre Dame section, and it was pretty depressing. Um, received Master of Divinity from the Seminary BA from uh, Indiana University. Boy, I'm really sorry about that as a Purdue grad. Um, he previously, previously served as pastor at Emanuel Lutheran Church in Arcadia, Indiana. Um, he's audition, he is, uh, in addition to his 2005 book, Luke, Jesus, and the Law, he's published many articles, reviews, papers, and a frequent guest on KFUO radios, Issues, Etc. How many of you get the, the Issues, Etc. podcast? Yay. It's, it's on, you can get it on your phone. It's real easy. I do it every day. And it has, sends me a little, their, their apps, just Issues, Etc. has an app, and they'll send you. Okay, Issues, Etc. is a radio, pro, a Lutheran radio program, talk program about current events and issues, stuff in the news. I mean, you'd be really surprised the broad range of topics that they talk about. But it's always through a Lutheran lens. And it's really, it's, I mean, it's, it's a fun, you know, if you're into talk radio, it's a great listen. And you can get the app, um, and the iPhone app, and you can just, it'll even notify you, or you can do podcasts, or you can do it listen live. Um, Pastor Scare also serves as president of Allen County Right to Life and is one of the founders of an ecumenical group called Shepherds United, founded to defend innocent life, traditional marriage, and the free exercise of religion. Help me welcome Dr. Peter Scare. Okay. Um, the fact that you guys are here, I don't know if you really recognize how historic this is. Um, I'm 46 years old, so an old man. This is my first time coming to the march. And maybe I wouldn't have come if Maggie had not invited me. Although I've been very, very active in Fort Wayne. So the first time I've come here, 46, and you're all 16, 17, 18, younger 20s maybe, and you're here. And it says something about, I don't know what your feelings were at the march, if you've had time to kind of process it, but a few things you probably noticed. Um, one is, if you had to say who's there at the march, you would say, it's the Catholics, right? I mean, the Catholics were everywhere. And uh, now Lutherans are coming up. We had a great, I wish you could have walked with us. But for years, this has been thought of as a Catholic issue. But no more. This must be our Lutheran issue. And because you're here, I think it's going to... See, for a long time, too, Lutherans thought about abortion as one of the moral issues. So, like, I'm against pornography. That's a moral issue. I'm against lying and cheating and stealing. Those are moral issues. But that's not what motivated the people at the march. If you looked at the people at the march, they weren't talking about doctrines. We need to learn the two kingdoms doctrine, that's what pa President Harrison said. But they weren't motivated by doctrines in that sort of way. They were motivated by babies. <laughs> I mean, how many pictures did you see? What brings a person out to Washington, D.C.? Is it to make a stand? Are you going to come and are you going to, what, are you going to make a, uh, dem be a part of a demonstration in order to clean the environment? Well, that's good. Are you going to be part of a demonstration in order to end nuclear war? Well, okay, you can do a lot of demonstrations. But this is different because this, now we're not talking about things. We're not talking about issues. We're talking about children, 55 million of them. And I think, um, 
you know, now that, now that we have some young people here, um, how many more young people would there be if not for abortion? 55 million children are no longer here. Now, I think it's an attitude that we have in our country in which children are not valued. We've been slow to address the abortion issue, too, I think, because we've got to think more clearly about what our values are. And you as Christians, we need to think about what your values are. And as Lutherans, we are well situated to do so. Now, there are two things. Um, one, we just celebrated Christmas. Now, Christmas is the celebration of the birth of our Lord. But our Lord came into this world not simply when he was born. He came when he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, living in the womb of his mother Mary. One of the great pictures is, in all of scriptures is of the two women coming together. Elizabeth with a child in her womb, Mary with a child in hers. And what happened? Well, that child, John the Baptist, leapt in the womb at the, at the sound of Mary's voice. The child, John the Baptist, in faith. Children have faith. They have minds. And I'm not talking about newborns. I'm talking about the children in the womb. Children already in the womb get to know the voice of their mother. Children in the womb um, can indeed have faith. And every one of us was just was like one of those children. So when you march today, yesterday, you weren't marching for an issue. You were marching for your baby brothers and sisters. You're watching, you were marching for people who were just like you. Now, what's kept us, I think, from being stronger on this issue? One is we kind of like to avoid this. Lutherans were not political people. We like to think, you know, one of the favorite Bible passages of Lutherans is Romans 13. And we're all, we always pride ourselves on being good citizens. You gotta ask yourself this, when you go to church and you look at the altar, now we don't have it here, but um, most churches, the church where I was at, there, there were flags by the altar. There was the Christian flag, I don't know, do you have that at your church? There was the Christian flag on the one side and the American flag on the other. Now, I have to admit, um, when I was a pastor, I made a big mistake because it was during the season of Lent and we were going to put all this other stuff up in the sanctuary, including, you know, an old cross and we, we were decorating the sanctuary and for that time, there was no room to keep the flags there. Well, so I took the flags out and then when Lent ended and the Easter season, I didn't put them back in. And I thought, well, maybe they won't notice. And of course they did. They were furious with me. Um, because in their minds, uh, allegiance to the flag was a very good thing, which it is. Um, but to have it by the altar sends a mixed message. Because um, our allegiance to the flag, now here's another thing. I, Again, I don't want to be too personal here, but as you, just, as you think about these things, um, I couldn't help when I visited, uh, we have a great contingent here from Concordia High School. I am so proud, I'm so glad that you're here. It just, it makes me, uh, that my, it makes me so full of gratitude. But think about this. Outside of your high school, you have flags, you know, you know that? Maybe you don't even pay attention, probably, because it's just, it's just like in the background, right? Well, of the, in the flags, there is the highest flag is the flag, as it is, should be by law, of the United States of America, the stars and stripes. Below that flag, what flag is it? The Christian flag. Now, okay, you can say that's fine, which, it, which really it is. I don't mean to pick on the flags thing but it's a mentality, which is to say, if you're gonna have, I think, get rid of the Christian, if you're gonna have a flag, how can any flag which has the cross be lower than the stars and stripes? Which is to say, our allegiance is first to God. Your allegiance is first to God. So Romans 13, we love that, we are good citizens. And in Romans 13, we are told something like, um, 
you are to obey your leaders. And uh, you have nothing to fear from your leaders because they punish evil doing. And if you want to receive the commendation of your leaders, to do what's right. Now that's basically true. So I know, I mean, I think when I was your age, <laughs> I used to do, it was, I mean, I, the way I drove to school, I did drive to Concordia. And I went down Auburn Road, which is at that time 30 miles an hour maybe, I'm not sure. I think I drove like 50. And I was always on the lookout for the cop. Well, Romans 13 was right. Um, if I were not speeding, I would have nothing to fear from the policeman. Although I have to admit, whenever a policeman comes behind me, even if I'm completely, I'm doing anything wrong whatsoever, I get nervous. And I'm like looking at my blinkers and I'm making sure that I'm looking like a cheerful citizen. Um, <laughs> well, it, it is true generally that if you don't do any, if you don't cheat on your taxes, if you don't um, go out drinking before the legal age, I mean, there are a lot of things, then you have nothing to fear. Basically, that's true. But we're getting into an age where that's no longer the case, which is to say, um, look at the unborn. Have they done anything wrong? No. We believe in original sin. On the other hand, in another way, they are the epitome of innocence. And yet they have a great deal to fear from a government, a government which not only permits and encourages abortion, but even through the funding of Planned Parenthood, actually funds abortion clinics. Now you can say, well, they're not funding abortion. Well, they're paying for the heat, the air conditioning, the staff of the people who are committing the abortions. Now in your own in our own town of Fort Wayne, it's, I would encourage you to get active. And one of the first, first things I think to do is if you haven't had the experience, is go visit the local abortion clinic. Which is to say, now we have various programs in Fort Wayne, like 40 Days for Life. But in Fort Wayne, you may know, and you could do this during the summer, maybe when you have time. But there's an abortion clinic near Concordia High School and it's right behind you know, Mike's Car Wash on State and Coliseum. And every Tuesday, women come in, and uh, we have a waiting period in Indiana. Every Tuesday, women come into the abortion clinic and, uh, for, for their referral, and every Thursday morning, they come in to have the deed done. And you can't help but be moved. See, this is, again, we gotta get out of this idea that it's, it's not just political, Certainly not moral. I mean, you can break a commandment, right? And uh, you break a commandment, and then you can ask for forgiveness, and you are forgiven. And even the sin of abortion, of course, can be forgiven. The blood of Christ is shed for every child and covers all sin. But it's not primarily a moral, dis moral problem. At least it's not simply about the individual. To a woman walks in to the clinic with a child. Two patients go in, one comes out, and that woman is wounded. Wounded by the surgery, and wounded also uh, in her conscience and in her soul. And she's broken down by it. And she's got to make some decisions, even after making that decision. Is she going to live with that guilt, or is she going to confess it and be freed from be freed from the sin. Now, um, we don't like to be politically involved. It doesn't come naturally to us as Lutherans, because again, we like to be good citizens. And we like to believe that if we are good citizens, then somehow we'll get, government will pat us on the head or something like that, and we're, we're you know, because we, we like to think that uh, we're not rebels or radicals. On this one, we have to be radical. Now the time is coming and is coming now, and I, I, I feel for you who are young, because you will face a society which frankly we've been kind of living on easy street for a long time, my generation. And the easy street has been that everything is taken care of and everything's gonna be okay. I think we're coming to the age when everything is not gonna be okay, and you're gonna live through it. 
President Harrison spoke about, he likes to use those Greek words about uh, life, mercy, and witness together. Well, life together is life in the womb together. The other word, though, is martyria. That's the witness word, that we are to be a witness to the world. Well, of course, from martyria, the word for witness comes the word martyr. And to be a martyr means to be willing and then to actually carry through the shedding of blood, your own blood, which is to say, what sacrifices are we willing to make? If, if you knew that little children were being butchered next door to you, what would you do? Would you be willing to stand up for them? Would you be willing to make your voice heard? Would you be willing to tell your politicians? Would you be willing to... There's so much that can be done. Um, now, and I do think that, that there's another... This, is, this gets to be a little sensitive, and I, I like to say it to you because you're young now. And um, a lot of my generation and before that, we went through the sexual revolution. The 60s, and it all came, began with the pill, which is, so, so birth control. With the advent of birth control, we became a sexualized nation, which means people can do what they want to do. And women say, this was always part of, you've got to watch what you hear. Women say, this is my body and I can do with it what I want. St. Paul says the sins that we commit in the body are actually greater. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. You are meant for better things. You may raise, you've been raised to a higher level. And you are not your own. You belong to Christ. And I want especially you who are women to carry yourselves with dignity. And the, you know, those of you who are, I mean, at Concordia, you have a great head start with that, and in college also. But carry yourself with a certain dignity as one who has been redeemed by Christ Jesus, as one who has been baptized into his name. You are special, and you are daughters of the king, and you should act that way, which means, and I think that if we're going to talk about, it just doesn't get said, but it needs to be said especially to you, that if we're going to talk about abortion, we also have to talk about sexual purity. Because how does this, thing, how does this happen? It's no coincidence that with um, sexual promiscuity, with sex outside of marriage, that uh, the abortions have risen. Now, don't think that, uh, now the pill, the little magic pill, doesn't work, which is to say, eat contraceptives fail. And that's the way they're designed. And for men, young men should know condoms fail. And this is, uh, <laughs> I, you know, the word on the street, I like to see whether this is true or not, but um, the word on the street is, if, if, and this is also very important for you who are going to college now, because at college, it's, it's actually, we, you've heard a lot about Planned Parenthood. You're in Fort Wayne, it's not as prominent. If you go to a place like Indiana University, which I love, um, but if you go to a place like Indiana University, Planned Parenthood is everywhere. And they're handing out to all the young men condoms. Well, in some ways, it's playful, it's funny, right? Uh, the word on the street is, they have the worst condoms in the business. <laughs> now, why is that? Because um, when I think about groups like that, I think about, if you, if you remember when you were young, uh, Hansel and Gretel, the story. They go into the woods, and there's, the, <laughs> there's, there's that old crone of a witch who's there in the house. And she bring, wins them over with cookies. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived that these people are your friends. They are not. Um, and this also goes to why abortion is, pers why is abortion, why is it, does it persist, and why don't the politicians do anything about it? Part of that is because we're all in this together with guilt. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, but uh, many of our political leaders have been compromised, and I have nothing against them. But if you yourself have had an affair, and, you're, and the girl uh, you encouraged to get an abortion, how can you stand up against it? If you yourself, if, if it's been in your family, how can you stand up against it? Well, 
I think in some ways, this is where the group like Silent No More needs to speak, because you can stand up against it. And okay, I'm a preacher, right? So I'm not going to tell you everything I've done in my life. I'm not going to tell you about uh, my... Uh, uh, if, if I only spoke about the commandments that I haven't broken, I would never say anything. Every commandment, and this is true about sin. One thing we know about, as Lutherans, when we think about sin, there is no sin that's ever been committed, any heinous sin, terrible sin, terrible deed that has been committed that's not, that doesn't already have its root in your own heart. So we can say, a woman has an abortion. So that's a terrible thing. And we can call it murder, which it is. Well, the murderous heart is our own heart. Uh, our Lord ratchets up the uh, morality, if you want to call it that. He says, what is adultery? Lust is adultery. <laughs> Raise your hand if you've not had that problem. What is murder? Hatred in your heart is murder. Despising your fellow man, your brother, your sister, is murder. When we talk about sin, we're not talking about something outside of us. We, we're talking about something which we know inherently because it's in each one of us. But that we also know that we are forgiven by Christ. We also know that there is healing and there is hope. Now there are two ways to deal. See, this is why abortion, though, persists. Because the world doesn't know how to deal with it. it, it what it is is basically, you know, if, if you know you're doing something bad, it doesn't t t take abortion off the table. But when you're, okay, you're talking about somebody behind their back and you're just kind of being malicious. What do you do if there's somebody who walks into the room and they say, why are you talking like that? Well, you try to recruit that other person to get in on your conversation because if everybody is engaging in the same thing, then you don't feel so bad about what you're doing. So it is that sinners love company. We all do. So if we're doing something bad, if we can recruit others to do it, then we feel somehow safer. Now this is also true when it comes to judgment. So if somehow we think that if everybody does it, if we could, and this is by the way, when you look at a group like Planned Parenthood, when you look at uh, the radical feminism, a lot of it has to do with recruitment. They want to recruit you to be part of, so that you do what they have done so that we're all in this together. And it's sobering. I, mean, I, I, I speak as a preacher. I don't feel comfortable saying these things. On the other hand, if I don't say it, who will? And then you need to also think about that. Because on the final day, on the day of judgment, we're not going to be there in a group. We're this is not simply every one of us mess fake face our maker on the last day. So it's okay to stand out and to stand apart. Now the other thing I would like to say is this, is that um, should you go off now, and I'm speaking especially to those who are going to college and those who are, if something should happen. So, um, and our Lord recognizes our weakness. If something should happen and go wrong, if you go down the wrong road, it doesn't mean that that's the end for you. That's what the devil wants to say, that that's the end for you, but it isn't. Always keep in mind the story of the prodigal son. The prodigal son despised his father, took his inheritance, and does what every, I mean, it's, it's, it's every college student's dream, young people. You got a load of money? It, look at, I mean, just look at, uh, all the, the celebrities who set this lifestyle for us. I don't know, even know. Britney Spears is a little long in the tooth now. She's old, but maybe, we could, maybe you guys could help me with the, you know, some of the younger stars. Well, what is it that they exemplify? They exemplify this kind of strange freedom. It usually work, ends up very badly for them, of course. It doesn't really work. They never find what they want. But if you should go down that road, you need to know that the doors of the church are always open for you. That the Father is always waiting there looking for you and all is forgiven even before you do it. And after you do it, there's no 
anger in God. God does not, if you do something, if you have an abortion, God forbid, if you do, know that you are already forgiven and there will be no retribution and there will be no shame and you will be embraced. That's the message of love, and that's the message of hope, and that's the message of healing. We're not here to tell society that we, uh, we, we don't have an ax to grind with society in that way. We don't want to spoil their fun. It's not like that at all. But we know the harm and danger that comes with this, comes with, um, comes with abortion, and it comes with this lifestyle that goes with it. And there's another thing I think um, that I'd like to touch on is, and again, these are sensitive issues. These are things to think about, though. One of the other reasons I think that abortion has taken hold in our land is um, a kind of suburban mentality, which is, and now it's, it's, it's an upwardly mobile mentality. It's that you have to ask yourself at this point in your life, what is it that I want out of life? Like, what are your goals in life? Do you, I mean, the, the kind of, and look at, look what's happened in, in our culture. It wasn't that long ago that large families were the norm. So if you look at like politicians, look at people, the, I mean, it'd be a little bit above my age. I was born in 66, the baby boom ended in supposedly the baby boomers, the last year was 65. If you look back before the pill, large families were common. And here I have three kids, so I don't have a large family. I'm, coming, I'm starting to think about these things later, perhaps, than I should have, but better late than never. Um, but, and again, there's no right or wrong. This is not about, oh, it's, a, it's, it's the morally right thing to do to have a big family. Or now you're told it's morally, if there is a big family, they get stares at at the mall. I don't know if you've noticed that, but a couple will come and they'll have six or seven kids and then people will make snide remarks. Oh, look at those breeders. Look at that, it's like a freak show, all those kids. Well that, see the thing is, is that's why you gotta read history. That's why you gotta go back because that's not uh, anything abnormal. That was the norm, larger families. Now I'm not telling you to have a large family. What I am telling you, and I'm telling myself that, is ask yourself what your priorities are. Now, as we've come to the smaller families, and I've witnessed this, what happens is the parents have only, <laughs> they have all their eggs in a, whatever, one or two baskets. They have the one or two kids, and they want to make sure that they thrive. So, every kid's got to have violin lessons. Every kid's, look at the sports craze. It's changed since I was here. Every kid's got to be the best basketball player, so we'll have summer camps, so there'll be really good basketball players. And guess what? So what? Do we have a lot? Are we now flooded with great violinists? No. And how many great basketball players are there? What's the purpose of all this? Now, um, so you, you can even take a great value like education. So. God willing, many of you are going to be going to college. That's a very good value. But is it the ultimate value? Now, why is education a value? Is it to ennoble the spirit? To, is it to, uh, to work so your character becomes developed? Or is it simply so that you become marketable for a job? Well, being marketable for a job is a really good thing. And I, again, I, I feel for you who are young because you have difficulties that you know, we did not face. Because I got out of college without really any debt. To, I, now, um, I work at the seminary, I'm in admissions. We have guys coming out after four years and you know, $50,000 debt. Their girlfriend, soon to be their wife, has a $50,000 debt. That's a hard way to begin life. But we have to ask yourself, what is the final purpose of my life? Is it simply that you become successful? If you do become successful, then what? So what? Um, and this is, when, when you look at, see the thing is, I want to talk, your worth does not depend on where you are necessarily in society, certainly not by how much money you make. That's part of the degradation of humanity. 
When you look at, um, go to Romans 1. What happened to humanity? We were created in God's image. Created in God's image, we had a dignity. We were masters of the house. And in that garden, there were the beasts of the field, and they were below us. And there were the birds of the air, and they fly above, but um, it is we who have been created in God's image. So he created us to be in relationship to him, and um, we are the head of creation. Well, what happened to humanity? It's, isn't it absurd that um, <laughs> I had the chance to go to, uh, to India, and uh, you, you drive into a village in India, and there's a, I don't know, 50-foot monkey god? It's a statue of a monkey, 50 foot high, and we're supposed to worship this thing. So, no, that's quite common in pagan cultures. Uh, the, the prophets talked about it in the Old Testament. They say, well, you know, you, you have the same tree in from one piece of the tree, you can make uh, a chair to sit on, so you put your rear on it. <laughs> and then with another piece of a tree, you carve out an idol, and you worship that. It's absurd, but that's what humanity does. Well, then we can say in America, right? <laughs> and again, I, I know it's, 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 too, uh, it's past your time, but I'm a Simpsons fan, and um, it was a show that was on maybe 20 years ago, I think, if you've heard of it. And uh, there's a, Homer goes to uh, the Quickie Mart, and there's an Indian guy, he's, uh, I don't know, what's his name, does anybody know? Apu, yeah. And Apu's got one of these little elephant gods. And Homer, he's over there in the corner feeding it peanuts. So do, do not feed my, do not feed my god peanuts. And it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's absolutely, it's, well, it's silly. Now, again, now that's not, think about sin this way. Is, it, is that the kind of sin that's like, there are certain sins that you understand. For instance, if your wallet is there and I see money, I am motivated by that. I take the money, well, I'm getting something out of it, right? There are certain sins, you're getting something out of it. When you look at idolatry, so worshiping that monkey god, it seems to me absurd. What is the purpose of this? Well, it, it shows the fallen humanity, that man who was created in God's image would become so low that they would now bow themselves to this. Well, then take the example of money again. You do know that our Lord spoke, preached often. He never preached out against idolatry like that. He never spoke about, uh, he never spoke about um, worshiping idols. Or remember, the classic story is in the Old Testament. Moses goes up on the mountain to meet God. God is speaking to their man, Moses, on the mountain. What do the people below do? They build a golden calf. Give us your gold, and then we'll worship it. It's absurd. It's stupid. It, what's that? And they called it Yahweh. Well, in Romans 1, it says, you who have been created in God's image, how is it that you've fallen? And think about sin as being fallen. It's like you, you fall off a cliff. Well, it's not simply that you fall, but you keep falling, and you get lower, and you get lower. You lose your dignity. You forget who you are. So that Paul can say, uh, look how bad it is. They worship images of men. They worship images of animals, of birds, and of creeping, crawling things, things that are on the ground, the lowliest of the low. How far has man fallen? Well, our Lord doesn't talk about idolatry in that way because he's talking to basically Jewish people. The Jewish people abhor idols. They wouldn't be caught with a, a statue of a god in their house. They wouldn't be caught with a monkey god or anything like that. But what was their idol? You cannot serve both God and yeah, money, mammon. Money is the god. And 
you could argue in our culture money is the god. How much do your parents make? Do they make a lot? What kind of car do you drive? Is it a good car? Are you embarrassed to be in the, seen in the car? Or do you feel good about the car because everybody knows that you've got money? Is that the way you judge your life? What kind of house do you live in? Do you live in the fancy neighborhood? If you do, then, well, then you're set. Do you live in maybe a neighborhood that's not as good as some of your classmates? Well, then I'm not sure if I want them over to my house because my house isn't as good as them because I don't have as much money. My worth is dependent upon that money. And I do think, um, and again, it doesn't have to be, we don't have to think of these, we don't have to say these things if the thoughts are actually infecting us and affecting how we behave. So what are we talk, talking about? What do we want for, what do people my age as parents want for people your age for your future? What's your biggest goal again? If it's money, if that's the, be if that's the best you can do, really you're no different than the guy who worships the monkey god. Because money will not do anything for you eternally. Money will not bring you joy. It will not bring you lasting happiness. So go ahead, earn that money, get that job. It's not against it. And use your, what you need to do is find out what your talents are and use them to the utmost in whatever field of endeavor. And if it's making money, then glory be to God for that. But use it wisely and be the master of that money rather than a slave to it. And then you become a, an idol worshiper. Well, uh, what's happened, this is, this is what makes it difficult, though. With the idea that every child now needs to go to college, which I fully embrace, that if you want to go, go, go to trade school, I fully embrace it. But what happens is it, your life is in some way more difficult than that of your grandparents. Because I don't, know what you're, I don't know what you've been told about what's the perfect age to get married, for instance. Well, you know, it wasn't that long ago. I, I had, a, I had uh, elderly people in my congregation. They often told the story of getting married when they're like 18 years old, 19 years old. And they think, oh, that's shocking, an 18-year-old getting married. And okay, I'm not telling you all to, although if you married somebody here, I'd be very happy because... You'd find somebody who cared about life, and that would be great, so I'm not going to discourage that. Um, but uh, part of what Planned Parenthood did, and a lot of this, we need to look back. You, you need to become students of history. I mean, I'm doing my best myself. But what Planned Parenthood did was they wanted to make it a law that nobody could get married until the age of, like, 25. Because... Because everybody needs to develop personally, they say, and everybody needs to, you've you got to get your career first. Well, this is a difficulty that you're going to have. You put off marriage to the age of 28, and again, I'm not against that, but also know when do your hormones pop the most? When do you actually, to be frank, who wants to have the sex the most? It's not, even with the Viagra commercials, it's not people my age and older. It's when you're young. So you've got to think about these things, and then as parents need to think about these things. What is it finally that you're trying to, and so you put yourself in temptation's way. And they know it, and we know it. What, whatever choices, and here's the thing, in, as Christians you have freedom. I'm not telling you to do one thing or another when it comes to the way you live your life. But I'm asking you to think about who you are specifically and first as a Christian. Not as a citizen. I don't want you to be thinking of yourself simply as a money maker. I want to think of yourself as a baptized child of God. And we'll come to the end, but I want to say, uh, so we think about the little ones. Um, are we, how, many, how many Lutherans do we have here? So... Well, I, one of the things I love as a Lutheran is to say, maybe you've sung the hymn, I am baptized into Christ. God's own child, I gladly say it, I am baptized into Christ. Well, we, we love to talk about the fact that we've been not only born, which is a gift that we've all been given, but we've actually also been born from on high. How can we 
who have received not one birth, but two births, not then fight for the right of every child to be given that first birth. And that's why you're here, and that's why I'm grateful for you, and if my words have been heavy, um, I apologize. On the other hand, um, I think the great things are coming from you, and I think you have great potential, and I want you to reach that potential, and I personally think that you could be the generation that turns these things around. And it will be because you actually value your life and you value the lives of children. Because that will be, your priorities are different than the priorities of the world. Now one of the things, I gotta stop here, but one of the things that Matt Harrison likes to say is that um, he tells, he tells it not, no, you're, too, you're not married yet, but he says, go and have sex. And by that he means enjoy your married life and celebrate the gift of life. And that is a powerful witness to the world. And while the rest of society despises children, we'll raise children. <laughs> and that will be the army that wins it. Because we have the young people because we know Christ's love for us. So thank you for your time. And I'm very proud of you. And I'm humbled to be in your presence because you are way ahead of the game. Thank you.